Well, good morning, everyone. And I want to thank everyone for being here this morning and trust that y'all are, had a pretty good week. We thank the Lord for all of the way that he does go before us. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, you may want to open your Bibles to John chapter 1 as we start here this morning. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the time that we have, Father, to be set apart from the world, a place to come, Father, to worship you here this morning. And Lord, we ask that all that's said and done in these services this morning would honor and glorify you. Father, we specifically ask for this particular class here this morning as we look into your word that we would see the things that you'd have us to see, hear the things that you would have us to hear, and, Father, bring those into our lives, that we may grow, Father, in your grace and in your truth, and that we may know him better than we did before we came in here this morning. Father, what a blessing it is to know, Father, that we, by your grace, can be your children. And I pray everyone here is a, is a child of yours here this morning. And Father, that in, in that we have all the assurances that we need of life eternal. And Father, the blessing of knowing that every circumstance of this day, as every day, is in your hand. And we can be confident, therefore, in the day as well. Lord, we get anxious, we get excited, we get concerned. But Lord, help us to have the right balance. To understand that we're to walk in your wonderful truth. We're to be your ambassadors. And we're to be focused upon those things that truly are from above. So, Lord, I thank you again for this time and place. We thank you for your word that we have in our hand here this morning. And we ask you to rule and overrule in all that's said and done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Of, chapter John, of John. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with John. And the Word was with God. I'm sorry. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was, was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with Him. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. <clears throat> The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of, of, of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little... <coughs> I didn't bring my water this morning. I may go, go, go... Yeah, if you don't, I just, I didn't bring it. I always do, and I think I probably need just a little bit. Oh, thank you so much. Boy, you are prepared there. Thank you. you must have known what I was going to need this morning. Huh? No, no, I've got... I've, Naomi takes care of my hard candy situation about every time I come, so I'm in good shape there. 
Let me see if that, I think that, that'll, whoops, that'll do it right there. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. As we looked at our scripture in this morning, I thought it might be good to kind of consider a couple of things, and one of the scriptures I wanted to kind of point out here this morning is we had looked at last, in our last study, we looked at those first five verses, and we saw by God's grace Christ as God, the creator of all that there is, and the marvelous blessings that we could begin to, to recognize of truly who he is. We think of him as the man of this world, and he was a man. But in Hebrews 11.3 it says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And when we go to Hebrews, the very first thing we open up, those very first verses tell us that he literally spoke and the world was. All that he said happened. And of course we see that in Genesis. It says that, and it says, so that things which are seen, things which are seen were not made of things which do not appear. Now that's really quite a verse when you think about it for just a moment. What it's talking about is, is that when people talk about things that are made, they talk about maybe things that had to exist before. Everything that's made had to have something to make it with, didn't it? But this verse lets us know that, you know something, when there was nothing at all, nothing at all to make anything with, God made everything. So it's really just something for us to consider as we think about who the Lord really is. And to understand. And then in Hebrews, again, of course, this is that great, uh, many call it the Hall of Faith as we look at chapter 11 in Hebrews 11. But it also goes on to say, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe what? That He is. That's so important. One cannot come to the Lord and not know who He is. Not just to know a name, but to know truly who, who, who the Lord is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Meaning that, that, that uh, the, salva- the, the, the knowledge of the Lord is open to all that will truly seek to know it. In our study this morning, we're going to kind of look at, what, uh, look at John. We're going to recall some of his ministry. Now, Pastor Joe did a wonderful study on that in his message uh, last uh, Sunday. So we don't need to go through John except to say a few things about him that I think are kind of important for us to look at here this morning. We want to realize that John recalls the ministry of John the Baptist as he kind of reflects back. And he thinks upon him, and I think he's thinking also about Israel. And he's thinking about how Israel, after all that had been done and all that Jesus had done in the world and all the ministry that had gone out, remember that he's after Paul and he's after all these other apostles that had been out already preaching and teaching the Word of God throughout the world. But he's, he just marvels at, at that and seeing how Jerusalem was destroyed and all that had happened, and still Israel was rejecting their, their, their Messiah. He was, I think, just in awe of that. When we think about the, one of the themes in the Gospel of John is simply this. It's belief. It's about belief, isn't it? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe. But it also is about unbelief as well, isn't it? We find both being taught pretty much at the same, side by side. And these themes are both developed. We see them so clearly, even in our prologue here this morning. Now looking again at verse 6, we pick it up. And it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Might believe. He was not the light. Makes it very clear. You know something interesting about John? We think of John the Baptist. Boy, what a great man of God he was. We think of so many of the others, the apostles and all. But you know what John didn't do? He never did any miracles. Isn't that something? But yet, he was empowered by God from his birth. And we saw that as as, as Pastor Joe had brought out in the last message from last week. We know that, that, that he was sent from God. He was the messenger of God. And his birth, we know, was certainly under miraculous circumstances. Kind of like Abraham and, with Isaac, who was born of, of, of Sarah long after they were of age to have children. Samuel, the same thing. Long after 
his, his mother was able to really have children. And then, of course, John the Baptist, the same thing with Zechariah and Elizabeth, long after the time that they were to have children. But what we see in this is some very interesting things. We also know that John was what was known as a Nazarite or a Nazarene. That was a very important thing. A Nazarene is someone that is really, we might say, super separated. One that is fully concentrated to the Lord. There's only a few people mentioned in Scripture that, are, that, are, that, 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 that were Nazarites. One was Samuel, who was the very first prophet. The other was Samuel, I mean, was, uh, was Samson. He was a you know, little back and forth. He wasn't the best one, okay? Uh, kind of failed, we might say. But in the end, maybe some would say he did well. And then, of course, last of all, we have John the Baptist, who is literally the last prophet you know, in, in that sense. But when we think of John, we want to realize that he was a whole lot more than a prophet, wasn't he? Because Jesus says in Luke 7.24, he says, and when the, message of John was de- and when the messages of John were departed, these were those that came when John had asked him to go ask Jesus a specific question, and they had gone to talk to, talk to him, and uh, Jesus had answered that, and they were going back to John to give the answer that, that uh, Jesus had given them. But it says, and when the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And he said, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaking with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously appareled and live delicate, delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? I say unto you, much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messengers before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Again, Pastor Joe pointed that out last week in his, in his message. And, I like, and he went and he showed us in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, where that was the specific prophecy. But we go on and we see now in verse 28 it says, For I say, now this is the Lord speaking, for I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wow, that's really something, isn't it? Think about that just a minute. So you look at John the Baptist, you kind of consider the scriptures, you say, well, where was John, what what made John so great? John, I believe John, John the Baptist's greatness was not so much in his office or even really what he did. John's greatest greatness was in his very character. It's the character of John that we're speaking of, that he's speaking of here. One that lived as he did. Think of the humility that he had. He was the man that some were even thinking, you know, he might even be the Messiah. He was lifted up as being such a great man and a great prophet. Even we know that that even the Pharisees and Sadducees feared him in the sense of thinking that everyone knows that this is a man of God. There was no question about that. Did we see John get puffed up with himself? Did we see John take upon him in the ministry that he was really something after God? Quite the opposite. We see this great humility in him. We see him truly as we should be focused upon the Lord and glorifying the Lord and his purpose, which was to be the messenger. He is the messenger. And that's what we need to see. John spoke of life and he spoke of light. Light has to do with knowing. Life has to do with showing. And we see that throughout his ministry as well as what we're going to see through the Gospel of John. John the Baptist lived such a life, so wholly true to his calling and convictions, that Jesus could say, as we just said, that of all that were born of women, there was not a greater born than John the Baptist. Isn't that a great thing? Think about it. We read in the Bible a couple times where, you know, where it talks about when going before the Lord, and the Lord would say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. 
Is that the prayer of your heart here this morning? To hear those words when you, when you see the Lord? Wouldn't that be a wonderful blessing? It can be, can it? We can, we, 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 we can do that. We know that he was sent from God. His coming was prophesied long before by Isaiah. Of course, we see it in several places, but in Isaiah again, 40, 34, and Malachi uh, 1, 3, uh, 3, 1. We're not going to go there. Again, uh, Pastor last week did a good job of sharing all that with us. But no man can be sent from God unless he's come from God. And so thus we see where the real authority of John came from. Remember from the very birth. Remember the uniqueness of that birth. Remember that, that Zechariah, that cat that one time, they were allowed one time only in their life if they were ever chosen to go into the most holy of holies. It was by lot that they got that. Of course, we know the Lord controlled it. And Zechariah got that, got that. And he went in and he met the angel Gabriel who told him all things that were going to come to pass concerning his son when he was an old man. He and Elizabeth. His, 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 his birth was actually, we could say, a miraculous birth, wasn't it? Miraculous in that sense of when it was. Yes, his life and ministry were, were literally foretold before even, even uh, John the Baptist was, uh, was conceived. So we can see in a unique, a unique, a unique way how, how John the Baptist came from God. And we also see quite clearly from the Scriptures here what John's purpose was and how, how well John the Baptist fulfilled that specific ministry. In John verse 7, and John 1, 7, it says, Then some came for a witness, then some came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That was his purpose. That his purpose was to be the witness. And he goes on to say, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Who was that light? Well, the true light, as we know, we see in verse 9, it says that that was the true light which lieth every man that cometh into the world. He was, not, he, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know, my friends, we talked about this. We won't spend much time on it. But we talked about last week as we looked at all the fantastic things, we, just some of the things that we can consider concerning creation and what, our, what Jesus has done as God. And he knows all things before they ever were. He knew before the world even was what was going to happen. He knew before the price that he was going to have to pay in this world and what was going to have to transpire. And he knew how he was going to be rejected and hated and persecuted and crucified for making a way of escape. Of making a way to bring you and I and anyone else that would back into God's presence to have the life that he wanted us to have with him, to be a part of his family. The Bible even tells us to go so far as to be heirs and join heirs with him in all glory. We think about those things, and yet he did it anyway. He did it anyway. My friends, we need to consider the Lord in a love that we can't even begin to fathom. When we think in those kind of terms, when we face the challenges that we face in life so often that are so difficult for us, and we kind of wonder, well, where's the Lord in all this? Does He not know what my needs are? What's going on here? Has He forgotten me? Has He? Never. Never. And we need to focus and understand that we can be confident in spite of whatever circumstances those are. And we should be. We should have a testimony Testimony, no matter what, in season, out of season, and be prepared. The, Lord's getting, uh, the world is getting to be a tougher place to be a child of God. I think we're going to maybe see closing in on us very quickly. And most of us in here are in our twilight years, okay? Beautiful time of day. Twilight, isn't that pretty? That's where we are. A little painful, but it's pretty, right? Okay, but anyhow, we, we think of that. 
But there's so many others that are really going to face a world that is not going to have anything that we have experienced and the privileges that we have enjoyed. And God has known that. And we are there for whatever purpose. Our purpose is still here because we're still here. Let us be in tune to that. The world needs, needs, needs our testimonies today. We need to be the child of God that God has intended for us to be from the beginning. We should be focused upon in our walk, in our talk, and in our word of helping others to know that there is an answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ of the Bible. Yes, that's important. Yes, the light, was, the light we see is not only revealed and resisted, but wonderfully we see at the same time as we see how the world is resisting it. We saw how Israel resisted when he came out unto his own, but we see something else just as marvelous. But it was revealed. Looking in verse 12 now. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he powers to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Wow. How wonderful salvation is, isn't it? How easy. Here we have the essence of salvation in verse 12. It describes that remarkable spiritual rebirth that every true Christian comes to when we have been born again. First we see in this verse is that we must believe. Believe on His name. Then we see that we must, that we must receive it. When it says that, we, that as many as receive Him, we must receive the Lord. And then we must become, as it tells us, as we become the sons of God. What a privilege it is to know that those are all to each and every one of us. First, again, we look at the fact first that we must believe. What is it we must believe in? Well, I can believe that I'm going to leave here and get home by about 1 o'clock. Okay? I can believe that. Is that what I'm to believe in? I am to believe in Jesus Christ. It is the object of my faith that's important. It is the belief in what I place that in. The belief that I have must be in Christ. John actually uses in his epistle the name of Jesus more than anyone else. Over 247 times will we see the name of Jesus in the epistle. Throughout the gospel, we are constantly reminded and shown that Jesus Christ's deity that's one of the primary focuses within the Gospel of John. And yet at the same time, he keeps his humanity before us as well. Because both are so important in our understanding as a child of God here this morning. John never lets us forget that he was, that he was more than human. But he was both man and he was God. He was 100% man and he was 100% God. He was the God-man. Second, we must receive Him, as we saw, as many as receive Him. It's not enough just to believe that Jesus is a Savior, or just to believe that, 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 that He is the Savior. We must become, He must become our Savior, or my Savior personally. I need to receive Him personally. I can't have this idea that He's just a great man, or, or he's, He is the Savior, but I haven't received Him. I need to ask Him humbly to come into my life and know that He will by His grace. Because He has promised to do so to all, as we just saw. As we just saw, he, he will do it for all, as we saw when we said, as many as receive Him, as many as received Him, He, he, he gave us the power to become the sons of God. It truly is a great step to believe in His name, to come to that point that we do understand who He is. But in itself, it does not put us in the family of God. It requires us coming completely. And that's where we get to the second part. We must receive Him, as the Word of God says here. 
I'm still in the wrong place here. There we go. It's only when this happens that we can, that we receive him. It only involves making, making or inviting Jesus to come into our heart and life and to, and, and, and to really uh, reign in our innermost being. That's where the Lord needs to be, is within us. When I got saved, let me ask you a question. When I got saved and I came back in the very next day and I met my, I didn't, I didn't know Edith then. It was really probably before that. It could have been, I may have been saved. I, a couple times in my life I could have been, but I definitely during that time. But when I saw her again, do you think that she looked at me and saw a saved man? She saw the same fellow she looked at before, didn't she? But was I the same man? The Bible says no. You see, what happened was what was inside. In here is what happened. And I became a child of God. And then the Lord began to work things out in my life. And things began to change. Now, I can't tell you that I immediately took the road and went the right way and followed the path that the Lord had for me. I've done this back and forth all the way through life, including in my saved life that I'm not very proud of in some ways. But God's faithful. He didn't give up on me. Never gave up on me. In spite of myself and the opportunities that he's given me. But when we're saved, we become sons of God. As it tells us, as many as received him, then he gave the powers to become the sons of God. As a child of God, we are immediately indwelled with the Holy Spirit as well. The Holy Spirit brings the life of God into us. The life of God. And that's a wonderful thing as well. We are literally brought from death because we're, we're told that we're dead until we come into, in, in, into the life that we have through Christ. Upon that moment, we, become, we, we have life, but we not only have life, we have it eternally, don't we? We have it eternally. And not only do we have it eternally, but we have the third person of the Spirit of the, of the, of the Godhead living within us to help us, direct us if we will allow Him. We have volition, even as saved people, to make our own choices. We can choose to seek out the Lord, and the only way we're going to really do that is when we truly surrender our lives to Him. And we surrender ourselves to studying what the Lord has to say through prayer and through studying of His Word, and allow Him to speak to us and receive it humbly and to recognize its absolute truth and the proper foundation there that we can set for our lives. We literally, as the Bible teaches us, we are new creations in Christ. And we share in the divine nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. This is what happens through our Christian experience after we are saved. Not before we're saved. Not that I quit doing this and I stop doing that and I do this. And I, okay, God, I'm, I think I'm about there. What, am I close enough now? That's not what it is. It's simply recognizing into myself I'm already lost and without hope there's nothing in me that's good. And that I need a Savior. And I come with a whole heart and I say, Lord, save me. I'm asking you to save me. I want to be your child. And we can trust the Lord based upon His Word that if we will ask, He will receive us. If we will receive Him, He will receive us. And that very moment, I become a child of God. And something happens in my life, things begin to change. Old things pass away, and all the other things become new. You know, you begin to enjoy Christian fellowship. You enjoy, begin to enjoy people that are, were before just old. You know, you thought they were the most boring people in the world. These stupid Christians. I mean, they don't do anything. They don't know how to have fun. Right? All of a sudden, you start to find out, what was I kidding myself about? Was that fun? Well, all that stuff I was doing, or was I trying to convince myself how much fun I was having? Well, the Bible says that, you know, even some of that for a season can be pleasurable to some extent. Sin for a season, we know. But the truth is, is reality is, it's not. The true joy and peace comes through the knowledge of, of the Lord and the fellowship that we have with those of others of like precious faith. 
Oh, that reborn. And we also see from his word here that when we're reborn, it's a supernatural event, isn't it? It's nothing that I can do for it. I can't ever do anything. Notice in verse 13 what it says. It says, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Not of blood. In other words, I can't inherit it. If my parents were two of the greatest, you know, uh, Christians in the world, and I was born into their family, I am not a Christian. Am I? My father was a great pastor. Therefore, I am a pastor. You ever ask somebody about being saved, and they say, yeah, I go to this church. I go to that church. Or so-and-so is my pastor. My friends, none of that saved anybody. The only thing that saves somebody is when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they need to understand that. So it's never, it's never a blood. We never can inherit it. No, they can never make us saved. Nor is it of any human design. It talks about the will of the flesh. For example, some may say, well, yeah, I was baptized, therefore I am. Or maybe I was baptized as a child. does not make one saved, does it? It's good to be baptized as a, as a child. Many have been baptized. At, at, uh, some churches do it when they're, when they're newly born. And basically, that's for the parents. It's a dedication the parents are making to raise that child in the Christian ammunition of the Lord. The ammunition of the Lord. That's what that's about. It's not about him being saved. It's about him having the opportunity to be saved. And his parents are making the commitment to give him that opportunity is what that's about. Or if by we, all of this that we know, certainly not by my works or my ability to try to live a good life on my own, that's not going to ever save me. I can't be saved because I'm ever going to be good enough on my own. Or because I'm doing great religious works. I'm doing these great things in the church. I'm doing all this wonderful stuff. I've heard stories, and I can't think of who it was, but one was a great pastor that was preaching and teaching and doing all these wonderful things, and people were so enamored with him. He was a, he was a well-known pastor. And somewhere during, during, his, during his pastorate, one, night, one, one of the messages he was preaching, he realized in and of himself he was actually lost. And he needed to be saved. And he came down out of the pulpit and asked to be saved. You see, being a great pastor doesn't necessarily, if it's not, if the person has not truly been saved, doesn't make you saved. I heard Samuel say one time when he was talking about the school where he was going now, that there's many people that are getting into the pastorate today and looking at it as they would if they were going to be an engineer or a nurse or whatever they were going to be in life. They see it more as a job or a vocation than they do as a calling. My friends, a pastorate needs to be called. A teacher needs to be called. But you know something? You and I sitting here in the this, in this pews, we need to be called too because we have been if we're children of God. We've been called into the family of God. And we have a unique ministry that God has given to each of us, and we need to keep our focus there. No, not the things imparted to, to the new life. It's only the rebirth experience in which we become a child of God. The rebirth experience must come through faith that is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, look at verse 14. Verse 14 in John 1, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared Him. Going back now, looking at verse 14. Jesus was unique, for He was God from all eternity. We've already talked about that, but keep that in mind. He was God from all eternity. He joined Himself with sinful humanity. 
in the incarnation, which is what we're going to be celebrating here in the next few days or next, next, within the next few weeks. The God-man possesses all the attributes of deity. Let's remember that. When Jesus came into this world, he did set aside his glory. He set it aside, didn't give it up. He just set it aside. But he never set aside his deity. He was always God. In Philippians 2.6, it says, Who, being, the form of, in the, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. Yes, we see this very clearly. But also the attributes common to humanity, apart from sin, also he had, didn't he? He had all of it. He hungered, he thirsted. He felt pain. He knew what it was to be rejected for doing right. He knew what it was to be hated for trying to help people. Didn't he? He knew the pettiness of the world that we probably experience today and look at and just in awe and can't believe and think, wow, how can this all be? He could have fixed it like that if he wanted to. He didn't. He allowed himself all of that. He humbled himself to all of that. That's a wonderful thing. We've talked about it, but just can't say it enough of recognizing that we serve a God that would do that that you and I should be able to identify with him because we know, he, we know that he knows what it is to be in all of these situations, doesn't he, that we face, but a whole lot more than what we ever faced. He's a God that isn't just some abstract God or some God that is, you know, we read about or all, but he's someone that literally walked in this world and all that he experienced are things like we experience. And he saw it firsthand. He knew it all. But he did that for us. What a blessing. But it's good we have to realize something. He, it, he, could, it, he had to be the God-man in order to actually be the Savior. Why is that? Think about it. He had to have his humanity he had to have his humanity because what was needed was for him to suffer and to die for our salvation. He had to suffer and die for our salvation. He had to pay the price for my sin. And the only way he could do that was through his own blood. So it required him to become a man to do that, didn't it? He had to be that. And he had to be God. To make death effective as a payment for sin. Yes. What a blessing to think about. You know the word glory, when we think about that and we see it, it's kind of good to expand on that a little bit. When I think of glory, I just think of, wow, glory. You know, it's just a fantastic. It's, a, it's, a, it's just it's so awesome. But I looked at this, I thought, wow, that's really good too. I need to kind of maybe share this. Glory is the expression of a splendor of the divine manifestation and the attestment of the divine presence. That's what glory really is. It is really seeing the splendor of the divine manifestation and, the, and to attest of the divine presence. So here it means the visible manifestation of God in Christ. Again, we're seeing the deity of Christ continuously brought out in the Gospel of John. How important it is. When it says the only begotten, that's what it's speaking of, is this manifestation of God through Christ. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, we look at the wonderful story, and I'm sure Pastor Joe, that's where all of this is going with his teaching starting last week. As we look at this wonderful time of year and celebrate the birth of our Savior coming into the world. And we see that story told in Matthew and we see it told in Luke so beautifully and magnificently. But you know, when we look in the Gospel of John, what do we have? What we really have is what we really see here is we see rather the significance of, what's, of Christ's birth. Notice what it says. The Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The birth of the Lord Jesus was unique. When any other child is born in this world, it is the 
creation of a new personality. In other words, a new, literally, a new life is created. One that had never existed before. But when Jesus was born, it was not a new creation at all, was it? For he was coming into the world having existed from when? From all eternity. He comes in existing from all eternity. You know, literally in four words, John describes the incarnation of the Lord. He said simply this. He said, the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. Wow. The Word, the second person of the Trinity, whom John had just proven to be equal with God, becomes a man so that it might be said of him, he was made flesh. flesh. And he dwelt among us. The Word the word of the original, of the, in the original denotes a dwelling place or a tabernacle. Now, sometimes we think of our bodies, we should think of them as tabernacles because the Bible uses as a description. A tabernacle is basically a tent, isn't it? Many, how many of you know a tabernacle? We think of it and you can see it out in the window. Moses was leading them through the desert. We see that big tent and everything else. But a tent is what? It's temporary, isn't it? And we ought to think about that a few minutes. That's a good description. But it also is used here concerning the Lord. And what we see is the idea here is the temporary dwelling place. The tabernacle of glory was was actually what was hidden inside that. The tent on the outside was nothing very much to look at. It was just a tent. There was nothing real special about the tent. I mean, it had a red post, I think, painted on the outside. It's about the prettiest thing about it on the outside. But the real glory of the tabernacle was in its most inner parts, the Holy of Holies. The glory of the Lord was hidden as well. When He came to pitch His tent among us, He did not lay aside His deity, but He veiled His glory. And we beheld His glory. This is the new proof of what He was affirming, that that the Word of God became man. The first was that He had the, the, the first was that, that, that the world had seen him or was seeing him as a man. But now he adds that he had seen him in his proper glory as God and man united in one person, constituting him as the, as, as the unequaled son of the Father. There is no doubt that this refers to the transfiguration of the Holy Mount, which John had personally witnessed. When it talks about seeing him, when they had seen him in his glory, what is it talking about? It's really talking about the fact that John and some of them had seen, there was a, uh, 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 John and, and, um, uh, John and Peter and James were all there at the transfiguration. They saw Moses, they saw Isaiah, they saw them all together in glory at that moment. And I believe that's what it's, what's being talking to, or what's talked about here. Oh, and I, I love this verse in Peter as well. When we look in 1 Peter 1 and 12, and it says, unto whom it was revealed that not, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. I heard a pastor one time, it stuck with me all since then. He says it's as if the angels in heaven were peering over the banisters of heaven and looking down into the world and looking and seeing Jesus humbling Himself as He did. God humbling Himself as He did in this world to come into the world to do this work. And they were in awe considering what that work was. Yes, the angels looked upon God as he, was, as he humbled himself, and we see that in Philippians 2, in, chapters, in verses 5 through 8, when it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Isn't that a blessing, my friends? Yes, we'll pick this up next week because we're out of time. We'll start in verse 16 next week. And the fullness says, and and, and his fullness have 
have all we received, and that's grace for grace. Oh, this is such a fantastic, these verses are so fantastic. We're just, we can't get into the depth of all of these verses, but there's so much in all of these, the depth of them and, and how, how much is in them, how pregnant every one of these verses are with so much beauty and so much splendor as we consider what they really have to reveal to us concerning the blessings that we have as children of God here this morning. And with that, Pastor, would you close this morning, please, brother?